Right, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, hope everyone had a good lunch. Now, hopefully, I've got to try to keep you awake for the next few hours. Um, but I do, and I am told that there are bears later on. And if, if all else fails, I've got an extra bear up the front here for you, Ron. So my name is Gunter Ullman, uh, Chief Security Officer for the uh, cloud and AI groups with inside Microsoft. Um, yeah, Microsoft's a very big company. Uh, basically, what the areas that I'm responsible for are looking at the next year plus of security technologies that uh, we're going to build and apply and it's a longer term vision for Microsoft on the security front. And so what am I here today to talk about? Well, um, I thought long and hard about different sort of topics and I thought most appropriate for the, inter you know, for the team here or for the group here it was really about looking at how SIEM has changed. So security incident response, uh, incident and event management, how it's changed um, and where it's going next. The reason for the change is that um, well, I think you, if you've been watching the news fairly recently, you would have seen an awful lot about uh, cloud seam and cloud native seam, both in particular from Microsoft with uh, Azure Sentinel and uh, um, uh, Google with their Chronicle solutions. Um, and so these are all cloud-based, but more importantly, AI-based. So when I started looking at uh, doing incident response and event management a long time ago, um, how many of you, you know, had, have uh, begun their sort of security, security careers about 20 years, 20 years ago looking at things like, um, does anyone remember uh, Site Protector, Internet Security Site Protector? None? Okay, well that's all right. So over the years the technology required to analyze threats, to, um, uh, uh, to investigate um, compromises uh, and uh, to perform response has changed fundamentally during that time. So 20 years ago, if you were a poor old analyst, effectively you had tree type um, dialogues to start navigating and trying to find out what was a big red light and what it actually meant. That didn't really work very well, and so a couple of years later, the first generation of SIEM technologies came out, where effectively take all of those logs uh, from all of your, typically your network defenses, load them onto one place, uh, and then scroll through those logs, right? That didn't really work too well, you know, and so if you're a good analyst, you would have just effectively, you know, give me the command line uh, and write scripts to investigate and hunt through your SIEM technology to find those particular threats. That was okay uh, until the volume of data started increasing dramatically, right? And then we started to move on. So uh, if I sort of think of my career, about 2006 to about 2012, much of the technology then switched from uh, SIEM and command line to uh, Hadoop clusters. You know, so using uh, Hadoop and, and NoSQL type engines to be able to group and cluster types of events together and then start analyzing and looking for threats. And that was good, uh, except that you know you had to be a bit of a data scientist, uh, and more importantly, you probably had to have you know uh, if you've ever built uh, Hadoop clusters uh, and try to manage them, you probably spent about 90% of your time just trying to you know uh, manage the Hadoop cluster versus about 10 10% of your time actually trying to get data out of the systems. And so technology changed and moved on further. Uh, and so really today, much of the technology that you'll find for uh, looking at um, uh, security events uh, and security logs is really graph-based technologies. So in particular, uh, AI-based graphing uh, and uh, log analytics type systems. So that's been the 20-year journey. I think that the part where we are today is this, this thing called Cloud Seam. You know, and you know, wherever you pick up the press today, you will find lots and lots of notations about this whole thing about Cloud Seam. Um, I want to step back a little bit on that, and, and that is there is a different type of seam and what that actually sort of really means, right? So if you like today, there are three classes of seam and they get called cloud in various ways. So you've got your on-premises seam, okay? So effectively, this is my racked hardware. Uh, it's basically sized by the largest load I think I'm going to analyze, uh, and it will have local uh, source connectors, so local controls and connectors for uh, sending new commands to um, uh, say Bitdefender or to your Cisco, route, Cisco routers or firewalls. The bottleneck for that type of theme has always been data retention. So 
So many of the SIEM operators took their, you know, over the last three or four years, took their on-premises, uh, you know, uh, tin wraps uh, solutions, and effectively put them onto virtual machines and then loaded them up into the cloud. Okay, so at that point you have inf uh, infrastructure as a service type uh, hosting of SIEM uh, with a PaaS interface, so you know, a nice little web interface for controlling those. That's all right, you get a little bit of cloud scaling effect, normally for, you know, uh, rapid scaling across horizontally uh, from a data structure side, but in many ways you can sort of think of you know, that first generation or that, that stepping stone of generation of cloud seam was really sort of a managed type of service. The biggest bottleneck with that type of uh, approach has really been the IaaS pricing. So by moving from on-premises to the cloud, you're not really making use of anything, anything from the cloud side. You're effectively using the cloud as you know, an external, ho external hosting provider. Cloud Seam, in particular when it becomes cloud native, starts changing the way that we look at these things. So we move to a layered SaaS model uh, and more often to a service-like uh, architecture. So hyperscalable in, in all dimensions. Um, importantly, when you look at the, you know, uh, the solutions in this area, is now AI enabled and it's AI by default. Uh, and more importantly, I think you know, when we look at the Siemens technology as they're changing, especially now, um, DevOps compliant is mandatory, right? And so the DevOps cycle is now built into the cloud seam. The bottleneck, um, interesting, and, and I'll cover this in quite some, some detail really, is the bottleneck lies in the labeling process. So what that really means is that I've got all this data, I'll always have all this data, I'm very good at hunting through the data, the machines are even better at finding things through the data, it's just that the machines find things that have no labels uh, and requires an expert to understand and then decide on how to respond to the things that the, uh, the cloud throws up. So one of some of the big trends, right? Nice easy one I think for most people to understand when it comes to um, security information technologies really is the state of trend of this, if you like this hockey stick approach to data and data volume. So today, if we look at that you know, volume of data, I sort of break it down into a number of areas. So, if, so first of all, this, this, the volume of data is increasing, doubling, tripling you know, every week in some instances. So what, what constitutes that security data? So we're talking about alerts, events, and the logs. We're also engaging sort of the telemetry, right? Flows from the network devices, threat intelligence, uh, TTPs, uh, and detonations. Detonations, if you're not familiar with that, is effectively you know, a, lot, a lot more work has gone on taking a malicious link, malicious URL, or a um, suspicious file, and then opening it and, uh, in a controlled environment, watching what happens and extracting those behaviors. And so over that time, while those sort of technologies have changed uh, and we've added more technologies to that space, the role uh, and the use of Steam has changed. So you know, if your organization originally started with a SIEM technology and you're a large organization, you probably walked up to the stage, you have a SIEM of SIEMs because an individual SIEM couldn't handle this type of data going forward. Now when we're sort of cloud native SIEM uh, is the only really area that we can start dealing with the true huge volumes of data that we have to deal with. Um, to give you a little look under the cover, uh, and so you know, this one here is a, a, you know, the background of something like Azure Sentinel uh, from a cloud seam, but it will be the same type of approach for anyone that sort of goes, goes cloud native. So if anything from left and right, you have the data collection, so the data logs, the um, custom apps, uh, and the information that's being passed through there. Right, so we'll go through a passing engine, uh, and at that ingestion stage, there'll be a number of connectors, so for example, WEF, Syslog, and other types of connectors. The vendors themselves uh, of those devices will make their own connectors, there'll be network connectors, uh, and then there'll be custom data connectors for your own organizations and your own applications that you sort of built. The next stage, if I have those connectors, is effectively normalization. So how do I convert all these different, um, let's say I have three different vendors for vulnerability scanning, right? And they all call this, you know, they all call, I don't know, cross-site scripting vulnerability, um, have slightly different names and different sort of descriptions. I need to normalize those to bring them down into one description and to be able to understand and track that from a mapping perspective. Um, if I had to look at all the areas of security and where we are today, in particular from a SIEM technology, I think that that normalization phase is one of the areas that will probably, um, would, I would like to get rid of as fast as possible. 
you know, the normalization phase uh, loses a lot of data uh, and a lot of uh, new intelligence that way. So once we've normalized that data, we then move on to, so if you like, the storage. And so today's storage really can be broken down to three classes of storage. So log analytics, so effectively, how do I take all those logs and store it? in a searchable database, blob storage, so all the other information that can't be you know, stored in individual logs or individual analytics, uh, and then a graph DB, so taking some of the, the metadata, some of the highlights, and being able to use that as a mapping between intelligent clusters. After that, you know, the next area of uh, cloud native AI really is about you know, how to build and train the models for detection and classification. And, and we'll, we'll cover that in a lot more detail. After I've got these sort of, um, you know, machine learning models or AI models, then I can move on to enrichment. Okay, so they'll be taking in threat intelligence, uh, letting uh, analysts build up their own uh, bookmarks and building up their own data sets uh, and query sites uh, and security graphing. Okay, so be able to take that threat hunting experience through graph and convert that back into a replayable playbook, for example. And then the last stage really serve and visualize. So the UX, uh, which is always great fun to sort of play around with, but the, on the day to day side and from a SOC operations, really moving into um, the search uh, and sort of detection type technologies. So if that's the sort of, if you like, the core chunks uh, of uh, Steam technology, how do these things sort of play out? Okay, so when I look at where is the cutting edge today for Steam, but in particular um, the threat hunting experience uh, and, if you like, how these things are going to evolve, I think it's a good idea to take a snapshot of where the, you know, if, where the state of the art is today. So first of all, should be without any argument, the state of the art is cloud native, okay? The big thing here is um, all the data, all the time, okay? And it's really hard to understand or to stress how important that is and how big a change that is. So traditionally, if I was bound by the number of hard drives I had and at the speed of access, then maybe I could um, you know, analyze data, threat hunt, and retrospectively threat hunt through, say, 90 days, 180 days. Okay. Uh, if you've been following things like the Verizon reports, uh, threat reports, or the IBM reports, or I don't know, you name the next 50 threat reports that sort of come out every month or every quarter or every half year, what you'll find is that probably the average time to uh, detection uh, of a compromise is somewhere between about 190 to 200 days. So that's the average, right? Um, that means that your team really needs to have probably about three years, maybe five years of data uh, stored in it for you to be able to uh, look for threats, hunt for threats, investigate threats, uh, and uh, draw out um, uh, instant response plans against and to manage against that. The other key piece about being cloud native, uh, it obviously being hyperscalable, but also the cloud automation. Okay, so when when I look at um, cloud seam, what I also focus on my mind on is all of the workloads that are also in the clouds. Okay, uh, and this is a new area really of as organizations move from on-premise and have a mix of different, you know, uh, I think the on-premise uh, security environment has about 170 different types, uh, 170 classes of technology and about 70 different vendors on average. Okay, by the time you move to the clouds uh, and are run, uh, running advanced workloads, you're down to about 10 to 12 vendors uh, and about 70 technologies. Uh, but those technologies tend to be heavily weighted towards the cloud provider. As part of that package, though, the cloud provider is also providing all the automation that surrounds that. The next big piece really is visual investigation. Okay, so moving on from uh, simple queries uh, and entity matching to now be able to uh, traverse between entities such as users, assets, apps, and URLs, but also now between activities. Okay, so logins, transfers, usage, all the telemetry, all the statistics about connections and workloads as they go forward. Um, and more importantly, what we're now starting to see is the growth of new AIs that actually automate that visual integration, uh, visual investigation process of so being able to predict what you're going to be able to click on uh, and provide the best answer going forward. The next part of cutting edge is really the use of uh, machine learning notebooks. 
So the ability to be able to create your own machine learning classifiers, uh, train your own data sets, be able to t provide a almost an advanced scripting approach to automated hunting going forward. But more importantly, be able to take these um, uh, take these notebooks and be able to pass them on to other teams inside your organization uh, or be able to share them as playbooks externally. And while it's the third slot there, I could create many, many slides on this area, but effectively AI, right? So at the, at the large public cloud sites, uh, cloud service provider side, AI is pretty much everything that goes on behind the scenes here. So for example, the key things that I'm, uh, I'm most interested from the AI side, um, kill chain and attack uh, reassembly. Just want to be clear here. Does everyone you know, raise your hand if you don't know anything about kill chains? Raise your hand if you don't know the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Okay, a few. Unfortunately, I'm gonna, there's only a few of you here. I'll be happy to talk about it a little bit later. But uh, the ATT&CK framework is really where a lot of the technologies are now changing and moving to. So uh, yeah, upgrading from kill chain type approaches into the ATT&CK framework and ATT&CK reassembly. Also moving on to anomaly based detection. Um, Auto training of classifiers, so the ability to uh, train up an AI to solve a particular class of threats uh, or to identify a kill chain uh, and be able to then take that model and deploy it somewhere else and to relearn a new environment. So, for example, for me to be able to take a, a create a machine learning algorithm for spotting um, uh, impossible travel type scenarios for email brute forcing uh, or email access, uh, train that up inside the MSRC SOC, uh, and then be able to deploy that into on-premise scene for other customers and for it to relearn uh, and to be able to start detecting new, uh, that class of threat almost immediately. <laughs> Give you an idea of scale and why this is important. Okay. So one of the things that, you know, as a cloud provider, perhaps one of the most common scary attacks that I see uh, is this particular event. So what happens is that some bad guys guess the password or the, the login credentials for a customer's workspace, uh, so for their subscription. So they compromise the identity of the subscription owner. They then log in. They create a service principle, so effectively a new account for being able to manage the, the workloads or manage the subscription. They then add that newly created principle to the admin for that subscription, and then they start doing bad things. So extricating data, locking out systems, uh, spinning up Bitcoin mining, uh, all these sort of things. So that first thing, you know, if I want to go looking for these types of things, um, you know, how do I go about this? So today, you know, using the, uh, from an Azure customer's perspective, I see about 300 billion identity logins, right, per month. 4.1 billion Active Directory admin uh, actions, and about 3.2 billion Azure admin actions. Okay, so you can imagine if you had your seam still on premise, I've probably filled up your seam already, uh, just with the data that was, you know, that's required for looking at this one class of threats. Now, as I start using user behaviors and start looking at anomalous behaviors for those detections, I can start shrinking these things down, right? So if I'm looking for, uh, if I can start identifying behaviors, say that these actions happen in uh, are happening in sequence, and they were happening at a time that is you know, outside the normal business hours of that organization, uh, and things like this, right? I can start shrinking that down to about 28 million, so go from billions down to millions of identity detections, you know, 20 million anomalous Active Directory actions, uh, and 2 million anomalous Azure, uh, Azure actions. Now, if I'm smart, I start converting into graph-type relationships. Okay, and so the graph type relationships, I then start applying a probabilistic kill chain model to this. Okay, and so I start uh, bringing all of that, all that data down to effectively 320 graphs uh, or subgraphs, uh, which on a typical month at the moment sort of operates at about 18 cases. Okay, so if you sort of think from, from an analyst perspective, without that use of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but more particularly the use of graph 
graph type technologies, I would still be trying to sift through those 300 plus billion events to find out you know, which ones are actually resulted in something, uh, were about to result in something bad. Okay. So, so from my perspective, and as we, you know, as we go forward from a, as a cloud provider, um, I have to approach everything from this type of scale. Okay. Anything that I start looking at that requires or starts or requires a human to be involved in uh, is going to be a failure from the first start, right? So I have to look at it in a different, different way. So what we've also had over the time is that the, there's been changes in the way that hunters think. Okay, so a couple of decades ago, it was all about alerts. You know, let's go for, you know, we'll stack these alerts from green through to red or into brown, depending on your color scheme. You know, and you start with the brown and work down. Okay. Then we started moving on to event correlation. So just instead of looking for individual alerts, I want to bring these alerts together as clusters and be able to say this, these number of alerts represent a, a, a kill, a, 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 an attack pattern. Right, and that tag pattern then developed into timelines and kill chain reassembly. Um, for the last couple of years, that has, mode, you know, that has changed into the MITRE ATT&CK framework you know, and being able to build up the, the attack um, uh, attribution that goes behind there. And where we are today uh, from, from the machine learning side in particular is sort of the labeling and the training of response systems. Interesting one here really is from a threat hunter perspective, you know, for, for many organizations, almost the, the role as a security professional, the role that many people aspire to today is the threat hunter, right? And particularly to be the, the top, the best threat hunters there are inside an organization. Um, a question I've got though is that with all of the, the data that's coming in, um, into your organization, uh, first of all, how many of you here you know, do threat hunting? of some degree. Okay, so most of the hands here. How many of you, you know, raise your hand, if you, you, if you spend more of your day proactively hunting as opposed to having to just clean up and investigate stuff that someone else pointed out? Okay, three or four hands. Okay. So the interesting thing is that despite all these types of technologies that are out there uh, and the, the growth of threat hunting, um, threat hunting is still largely about incident response uh, and retroactive looking at threats, investigation of threats. Okay. Um, what we're also finding though is that we're getting more and more data. So our ability to acquire and process data uh, inside the cloud has resulted in customers and organizations turning on more logging, uh, richer logging, more events, and passing more data through. And so we're into the sort of um, you know, hamster wheel of more data creating more work, uh, providing more visibility into the threats. However, we have less time to investigate them from a human perspective. Uh, and from, you know, from a human perspective, we're also getting further away from when the event actually happens, so we're doing richer Retroactive, uh, retroactive hunting. Now, an interesting part of that really you know, translates into it used to be from a threat hunting perspective, it was hunting for needles in a haystack. Okay. Now, with the types of systems that we have, what we eventually end up is that we end up with a haystack of needles instead. More often than not, we've now moved on from a haystack of needles into haystacks labeled haystacks of needles, right? And so we have to figure out ways to prioritize the way that we investigate going forward. And so that prioritization comes in many sort of forms. And so, you know, a large part of today really focuses on um, how do we train AI systems to understand, to replicate what the, the human being's doing? How do we uh, you know, uh, engage the human in the, in the labeling process? But how do we actually score these types of events and so that we can, re, you know, we can reprioritize those? Well, so what we're seeing is a lot of integration of combining um, internal intelligence and third-party intelligence together. You know, and in the, in the case of the attack framework, also uh, the TTPs. You know, tools, tactics, and processes of the bad guys for be able to provide attribution. But those haystacks themselves keep on growing. Okay, uh, and so despite you know, for many organisations they may break their threat hunting teams into um, malware teams, APT teams, uh, and other specialised threats, um, those haystacks just keep on growing. So we've, you know, so for many organisations, what we're finding is that they're still swamped, no matter how many more people they come on. Uh, what we also find is that the more security technologies that are deployed, the more haystacks we end up creating, or needle stacks, should we say. 
So that sort of moves really on to cloud native threat hunting. Okay, so we have to relook at all the tooling and all the processes that we've used in the past and not only reinvent them, uh, but fundamentally change the way we do these things. So first of all, all the data, all the time. Okay. So that means the volume of data is no longer a bottleneck. So retention period is important. Um, ideally, as a threat hunter, you want to get as much of that data and store it for as long as possible. However, if you ask your CFO or your, or your chief legal officer, they'll probably say no more than seven years or no more than three years because of the legal constraints that are on, this, uh, on these things. What also means that you can hunt across larger periods of time uh, with new TI. Okay, so if you've got seven years, uh, you may get the you know, latest batch or threat intelligence from a Verizon report or whatever, and you can go back through those seven years and find out when you, were you know, may have been potentially compromised through that. The other part is actually learning from every single successful hunt. So from the good guy's side, you know, as you find um, and sift through this type of data, finding these particular threats, being able to describe that threat and labeling it, the, the machine then learns from that uh, and so that you need don't need to repeat that process going forward. Okay. And of course, to assemble and correlate all that data together. So what do these things sort of look like? You know, here's just a snapshot of uh, Azure Sentinel from two weeks ago uh, before I was traveling here. What you see is a different sort of approach uh, to, from a threat analyst perspective. So here what I've just grabbed is the um, different way of looking at the hunting procedure. So you sort of see in this top right-hand corner um, the MITRE uh, attack framework. So being able to take, instead of having a look at an entire kill chain uh, and try to piece together a kill chain from a graphical, pace, a graphical uh, perspective, start breaking, the down, breaking that down to individual components. Um, so for example, long DNS URI queries, for example, uh, which is part of, you know, a, which is a, associated with a number of TTPs for bad actors, uh, and start managing and hunting on that, uh, in that aspect. More importantly, what you sort of see is the, the stage of providing the attack framework, the ability to search and hunt on these individual things or collectively, uh, and the ability to modify, create your own queries, and then build compound queries going forward. If that's one way of sort of viewing how other technologies are sort of changing, I think the next part really is um, understanding um, what the cloud uh, and um, cloud AI actually brings to the table from a security experience. So here, you know, made up some graph. You know, here is a, if you like, a two-dimensional layout of all the different threats and alerts over time that are happening inside your organization. You know, in traditional way, what would happen is that we would look at these particular events, uh, build up a timeline, uh, and call that, you know, attack timeline, and you know, this would be perhaps our kill chain that we'd be studying. How we got there was in one of two ways, right? At some point, something was flashing loud enough, uh, red enough, flashing the most, or law enforcement knocked on their door and said, is this your set of data? You associate that with one particular event, and you start mapping everything that was associated with the event back in time, to eventually you get to the, the start, and say, so let's say the start was a little bit of uh, brute forcing, for example, right? The other way is that I have all this data, uh, and I am now given a uh, little piece of threat intelligence uh, of a um, let's say com uh, of a command and control uh, server, um, and I look through my logs and I find that that command and control server was used at this particular time, and I start building my kill chain in both directions. Okay. When I look at the combination of cloud and AI, I work the other direction, and that is I start from the very first events, and I start, you know, with every one of those events that I see, I start mapping up probabilities that this, this event is going to go and is going to be connected to another event, and whether that probability of that next, second event is going to lead to um, a type of threat, a type of TTP, uh, or an aspect of uh, maliciousness. And so what happens is that over time, you know, as I see these events cascading, I'm, eventually, I'm able to alert and provide insights saying that you know, I'm starting to build up a kill chain, but I've arrived in an earlier description of that this is heading towards something bad. Okay. 
So while that's happening, the other parts that are uh, fundamentally changing is the way that um, user and event behavioral analytics is coming into play. So today, much of the you know, on-premise UEBA type technologies are focused on the network layer, right? Um, uh, or you know, with inside, uh, say, the um, desktop protection suites installed on the actual host. Okay. So what's happening there is that I'm looking in real time at the raw data, uh, and I am creating new UEBA alerts on the fly uh, from that. When I'm looking at it from the scene perspective, I'm working in a different way. Right? From the scene perspective, you've got to assume that I don't have, you know, the scene doesn't have presence on the endpoint, it doesn't have presence uh, at the network. Instead, it's reliant on all those other security technologies that are already there that are creating new alerts, new events, uh, new incidents, uh, or just raw telemetry. So the traditional way from a, from a UEBA, UEBA perspective was you know, assume the attacker only takes one path to obtain their goal. It assumes the attacker follows a static kill chain uh, and that the attack path is fully executed. And it also assumes that the information is present in all the logs. Okay. That breaks most of the time. Right, and so from a cloud scene perspective, from applying AI, we do it a different way. So first of all, iterative, iterative attack simulation. So as I receive new logs, new events, I'm, made, I'm trying to predict where it's actually going to go, and I'm going to assign probabilities for these predictions. Uh, and so I'm going to fuse these different events that I'm seeing and collating, uh, and be able to um, uh, map those against certain scenarios, attack simulations that I care about the most from the organization. What I'm also doing is I'm going to provide a probabilistic kill chain, right? So as these events are, are happening and these fusion of the different events are coming together, I'm going to try to predict which way this event is actually going and what's uh, the servers uh, and what's the risk and priority uh, and also the overall impact of the organization as it goes forward. And then also using advances in graphical uh, methods, I'm also basically putting in random stuff uh, into those predictions just in case I might have missed an event or a class of technology wasn't deployed or something happened so that you know, I'm going to assume they're not going to miss out certain types of data and so I can project in advance going forward. Okay. What else is happening in this space? I think one of the... And you know, newer interesting areas uh, is AI-powered threat intelligence, in particular forecasting. So I started, before I got into security, my background is in uh, atmospheric physics uh, and meteorology, if you like, the, the first uh, you know, bigger uses of supercomputing before you know, everyone got into the nuclear trade, shall we say. Um, but the forecasting is an important part. And so where we are now seeing, what we're now seeing uh, the first generation of uh, AI um, based uh, threat intelligence systems, uh, commercial threat intelligence systems. So for example, you know, being able to take all that cloud information, the last 30 years of internet traffic, domain use, domain abuse, um, uh, malware, malware analytics, bring them all together, uh, and then be able to fuse and uh, project where these things are going. So for example, uh, one company based in San Diego, Cyclictics, um, provides an average of 51 days in advance notification that an IP or domain name is going to be used for badness uh, and what that badness is going to be with, uh, I think it's like maybe 97% probability. Right. Other ones like notice technologies are really looking at the threat actor and so is the threat actor, if, you know, you choose your list of threat actor that you care about uh, and you're notified in real time, you know, what uh, new infrastructure the bad guys have set up, uh, but it also provides, you know, prediction of what that what that infrastructure is probably going to be used for and what campaigns it's going to be used for today. So these are cool types of technologies, but you know, if you sort of think of um, how would I apply these you know, from, you know, from my existing type of security technologies, and this is where it gets interesting of being able to apply prediction systems uh, into Cloud Seam so that um, you know, you can pull in, you can watch the internet as a whole as a cloud provider and then predict how those changes that you're observing in the cloud are going to affect and potentially result in attacks against uh, uh, your customers and against their workloads. So from a threat hunting perspective, you know, we mapped out you know, those, those particular events and a bit of a kill chain. What we can also do is, as you're using graph technologies, you can build out all those other associations. So while if I was looking through events, I was just tracking back from, you know, uh, from the, 
the most evil back to the original start. There are an awful lot of other activities that the bad guys were doing at the same time, right? Uh, and the types of tools, the types of systems they, they touched, and things like that. This becomes a mix of TTPs. Um, and provides a little bit of a fingerprint for either a, um, a bad guy operator, a type of tool that they're using for automation, uh, or a, um, a class of attacks. And so effectively by combining those together, if I see these types of you know, um, shapes in the data, I can start building and training classifiers for this. Right. So all this today you can do yourself or just part of a cloud seam. You just sort of say, you know, here are these three attacks. I think they're all roughly the same. Um, click a button, go build a classifier, check that classifier against your, your data and see if you've seen other threats that are very much like this, right? And label that classifier. That's great for a you know, retroactive hunting perspective. The parts that are much more interested though are how do I get ahead of the threats uh, and start proactive hunting for these things. And so if I was to look at that type of um, you know, shape, that, that cluster, that's, uh, that machine learning instance, we're along this process, am I comfortable with a probability that it's going to lead to badness, right? Um, Completely artificial, made up in here, right? Um, yeah, at some point, could I say I'm 98 percent? Am I 75 percent? 20 percent? Yeah. At what point am I comfortable with this? And so, what's happening? And, and this is why the attack, mark, the, the MITRE attack framework, is so important. If I can take these smaller chunks here, these TTPs uh, or you know, phases of an attack. I can raise my confidence of being able to detect these things, uh, but I can also overlay those with a framework of the threats that I really care about, these bigger, tr uh, these bigger trains and labeled threats. Uh, and I can start doing things a little bit differently. In particular, I think one of the, the biggest things for, or one of the newest things from attack mitigation for the cloud it really has now become conditional access controls. So what conditional access controls allow me to do um, is that it is now possible to for, for the systems to uh, for the cloud to identify who the user is, who the victim is, who the attacker is, uh, and where in the attack process they actually are. So for example, Microsoft Cloud knows that Gunter Ullman is currently logged in here. My cell phone, when I last authenticated, uh, was here, roughly the same location. I used a PIN number to um, uh, on Windows Hello to open this machine, so for example. Uh, and because I have PowerPoint open and connected to the internet, um, probably the last time I made a change to the PowerPoint was automatically backed up. So it already knows all this type of information already. Now the bad guys that say that someone over in Singapore uh, has um, I don't know, brute force, successful brute force, you know, after you know, tried five times against the, the Gundromal account of a password and the sixth time they were successful. Okay. So first of all, the cloud knows that that is a different instance of Gundrolman here than it is over there in the first part, right? Um, through the machine learning side, it can also say, well, actually, I did see this brute forcing, which I think is suspicious, and the probability that this could be the start of a uh, ransomware attack is 16%, for example. So because it's so high, then what I will do as a conditional access is, tell you what, I will just turn Gunter's permissions on these servers to be read-only. Okay. And at the same time, maybe it's not Gunter, or maybe it is Gunter, and so they use the password, and so I'm going to ask for a, um, a different biometric for that particular instance. Right? And while that biometric is being calculated, so for example, prompt the MFA, um, I will also disable admin permissions sort of going on. And so what happens is that the, the systems are able to uniquely identify but take actions against uh, the bad guys without interrupting me while I'm doing this. Okay. You know, traditionally what would happen is that you know, a detection of that um, uh, my account had been brute forced and compromised, which would then happen that the result would be my account would be locked out. My machine would then prompt me up here saying that I've now been locked out, close all the applications and change my password. So the ability to separate these functions is highly important going forward for, without interrupting users uh, and also for mitigating the threat before it actually evolves into something bad. So cloud effects. There are a number of key things is that, if I sort of step back here, if you imagine that you know, 
you're running your organization, you have your workloads in the cloud, you see this amount of the cloud. From a cloud operator's perspective, I see across all those clouds, right? Not looking into your data, but looking at all the events that happen around those data and that. So for example, you know, I can tell you and tell the entire cloud when uh, a certain IP address that has never ever touched the Azure cloud and has never or may never have touched port 22 now suddenly starts doing that. I know that. And then I can apply that knowledge across the entire organization, right? And so I can start labeling and say, this is such anomalous behavior, then perhaps you want to be a little bit careful about this. And so I can also, you know, those, those models for detecting threats inside your organization, I can take those threat, those models and apply to larger data sets, refine those, and, become, and can spot different classes of threats and learn against those threats and then create smaller models that can be deployed inside your own organizations. What all of this means is the other way around, and that is, Let's say somewhere else in the cloud, a new attack uh, is detected, uh, it affects someone else. You know, I can see in this example is a watering hole and there's attack command and control. Uh, and from that, I can deduce the threat intelligence or the TI and the TTPs. And so from a cloud perspective is that if a threat is successful or a type of compromise that gets labeled from, uh, from anywhere inside the cloud, I can then apply that knowledge preemptively to everywhere else inside the clouds. Okay. And so the bigger the cloud becomes, um, the more... The, the, the faster the rest of the cloud becomes immune to these attacks. Now, if I'm operating on that side, unfortunately, one of the key things is I end up ditching a lot of human constraints. Okay. So I need to start thinking about you know, these logs and things that are human readable. You know, do they need to be human readable? In fact, one of the biggest constraints that I have today is RFC 5224, basically syslog. Okay. Here is something that is over 20 years old and defined for allowing humans to read what the machines are you know, basically spewing out. I also need to move to real time, not quote real time or real time TM type responses, right? So I need to be able to respond, observe these events as fast as possible and take actions uh, as these events are being collated. And also need to propose mitigations and responses to the threats. So what does that mean from a threat hunter perspective? Okay, so today if I look at you know, a typical threat hunter role, you know, starting from the bottom, tier one, tier two, tier three, so effectively um, tier one, you know, false positives, false positive removal, um, you know, type of things. Tier two, there is a script for that, there is a procedure, there is a methodology for that, go deal with it. And tier three, basically anything that skips those two paces, right? But with proactive threat hunting, incident response, being a bit of a security architect, also a risk commentator. From a cloud perspective, today if you're in the cloud, what's the role of the threat hunter? Um, effectively, tier three analyst, but a proactive hunting. Um, you know, the role of the security architect has become much more important. The risk uh, commentator, so instead of being able to say, the sky is falling, this vulnerability you should be scared about, to now be able to say, that vulnerability is there, but here are the things I can do to protect against this and uh, train the machine to, to remediate that. You also need to become a little bit of, be a bit of a data scientist, uh, and you also have picked up quite a larger role of becoming a machine learning trainer. Where this is really going, where I, if I had to lay bets on the next three to five years, then I think that threat hunting role uh, becomes quite different again. I think the proactive hunting goes away, mainly because the machines, uh, you have to operate at real time, and so the proactive hunting becomes entirely machine-based. What I'd also sort of see is that security architect becoming a cloud security architect, uh, and the data scientist piece is only a temporary part of time because we're still evolving those types of technologies, and I think data scientist's role goes away uh, as part of the security remit. Uh, and moving on from an ML trainer to AL trainer, AI trainer. And so the two big things that I pull out. So one is, you know, how these roles are changing, and, and that is from a, you know, um, chicken little, the sky is falling type of commentary to being able to be that um, business risk expert. And what that means is that you know, as an organization moves to the cloud, all of that um, infrastructure, the pen testing, the red teaming, all of that um, um, managing um, clusters, managing um, containers, managing um, uh, serverless types functions and that, 
you don't need to do anymore because it's the responsibility of the cloud provider. But what it means is that the biggest weakness in anything you push to the cloud will be the code that you push as an organization. And so it becomes more important about understanding what the um, business logic is uh, and be able to protect that. And what I also see is that you know, what today is you know, 60 plus percent of most threat hunters' role effectively disappearing down to just the tier three type analyst type of role. Okay. So we're running up on time here, and I'm thinking a few interesting pictures here, just see if everyone's awake. What do you think ties all of these pictures together? If you're sort of thinking of technology. Transportation? Transportation? Yes, a little bit more precise. Sorry? Roads? A little bit. A little bit true, true, but... Um, what brings all these things together? How we've designed our latest cars, our trains, buses, roads, infrastructure, is that everything's down, you know, even the containers that we ship things down is designed by the width of two horses' asses. Okay. So entire, so four and a half thousand years of evolution of transport is down to the width of two horses. Okay. And so, when I think of what AI and how we're applying AI to security today, I want to try rethinking this. You know, so today, you know, we talk about supervised and unsupervised learning a large part, right? So we're aligned on the human, and we're, so we have our aspects of how we've traditionally approached these types of roles before. We've also had the same data sets. You know, I mentioned about syslog. So these are things that were designed to be human readable. Okay. What if I move away from these things that are human readable and let the machines actually you know, enrich the data in ways that we, have, we, we humans can't no longer deal with? Right. Uh, and you know, what about when I start focusing on you know, faster, you know, do I want to build a faster, or better human to solve these types of problems or do I solve it a different way? Okay. And, and so, so it sort of brings up the sort of question about, you know, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to you know, build this superhuman AI threat hunter? Uh, or am I trying to solve the individual pieces to that? So if you like the, uh, you know, the, the first world's, the, the first robot citizen versus the, the Roomba or the um, you know, you know, lawnmower or the driverless cars and things like that. Although I did sort of see this, uh, you know, this uh, fully automated lawnmower and I, I didn't see any stickers about it being pet friendly. So. Yeah, and from my perspective, when we look at the cloud and that, uh, and where we are today, I much prefer to go down the second route uh, of you know getting the machine to specialize and solve these particular problems at this point in time. But it also means if I change the medium, if I change the way that I look at this particular problem, I can then start changing the way that I, I handle the threats. So if I moved away from, you know, since I moved to air travel or to sea travel, I'm no longer bound by the roads or that, you know, the width of two horses. And so if I start changing the medium, start looking at different ways of approaching AI and different ways of approaching data storage within the within a, within a cloud, then perhaps I'm going to open up new ways of thinking about and solving these problems going forward. So the evolution of machine learning, I think, is a, is a key part here. And that is what I'm, what I'm guessing uh, is you know, as the cloud has become more centralized and has more data in it, what we're also seeing is the growth of the intelligent edge. Okay, so what we're seeing there is that we require more compute to also happen on the edge points of the cloud and also the edge point of those touching of those technologies. And so I think what we're in the, at the cusp of doing today is moving a way in parallel of instead of having just the AI central and saying, bring me all the data in one place and I'm going to analyze it a little bit of a superhuman type uh, aspect, is that I need to also have AI systems that are on the very edge of my network uh, or on the very edge of the cloud to make those first pass decisions. Right. And one way of sort of thinking of this is, you know, as data volumes increase, as speed of connections increase, as the speed of the threat comes, you know, I've got to battle, you know, I'm, you know as Microsoft, I'm already battling uh, machine learning and AI powered attack systems are against me already. So I have to operate at those sort of speeds, if not faster. Right. And so I start to, sort of thinking about, if you like, from the military side, I want those smart lieutenants at the edge facing the, the raw part of the battle, dealing with the attacks as they come in, making those decisions. But I also want to grow and groom those generals 
from an AI perspective, centrally taking up the next four or five steps in advance of how I'm going to not only mitigate the particular threat, but how am I going to remove the attacker from the system or from the internet at the same time. So as I wrap up, things to amanar over beverages with friends or beers tonight, I think from eight o'clock tonight, I think it was, for, for beers tonight. So, Speed of response. The human is the bottleneck. You know, if you're doing things in the cloud and thinking about cloud security and all that, and you rely on humans, that, and humans are part of that process, step back, look at other ways of approaching this. So threat hunting will change, but for the better. Uh, all the data, all the time, from everywhere. So the machines do this thing a lot better than we can. Right? At this stage, they're still learning from us. Uh, we're still training these types of systems. But even then, given the data volumes and the types of things they can find, uh, it's, you know, it's clear that the machines are winning in this space on our behalf. Okay. So what used to be you know, the nemesis for a threat hunter or a security person was those rare edge events, those anomalies. Machine learning systems excel at finding anomalies. That's the easiest thing they can possibly find, find those anomalies. The hard part is you know, getting those anomalies labeled and described and then classified as some type of risk. And as we program this part, conditional response systems, so being able to use threat prediction, being able to use AI to um, map activities as they're occurring, and then to take small steps injected intelligently into those processes to deflect or mitigate a threat without compromising the current user uh, or the environment that needs to run and keep on running business systems going forward. Um, and the last part is, you know, if you set your goal to be a threat, threat analyst uh, today, this is not saying that you know, in uh, two years' time, three years' time, you're going to be out of a job. What's really happening, though, from a cloud perspective and for organizations that move to the cloud, that threat analyst, uh, that threat hunting role is turning into a business security analyst role, right? And so the role is becoming in both one, spa one space, both more technical in understanding the class of threats and how the operators, uh, the bad guys operate, but also becoming much more in tune about it precisely what those, what those threats mean and impact as your organization as a whole, and being able to do that translation from uh, what is a threat and what an AI classes as a threat and to mitigate into business systems. So with that, I realize that I've been talking for quite some time, so I'd like to open the floor to let you guys talk, and maybe there's uh, any sort of questions out there. Have I stunned everyone to silence, or is everyone in like a, a lunch coma? Sure, question down the front here. Share your threat hunting uh, notebooks, those are Jupyter notebooks, I assume? Yes, yeah, so the question was, do we share the um, threat hunting um, notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks, and things like that. So yes, you may have saw or seen um, at the beginning of this year a small acquisition that Microsoft did called GitHub, uh, and as part of that, so we've made uh, um, all of the Azure Sentinel um, type of uh, threat hunting notebooks, all the machine learning, um, Jupyter notebooks, and things like that are all available there, uh, and we're trying to build up that community. I think there are, last I heard, was about 8,000 different uh, notebooks for different classes of threats there today. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, down the back there. Yeah, so the question, do I see a big risk in um, poisoning of data behind sort of the models? Um, Yes, for some types of things. So for machine learning you know, and supervised, unsupervised learning and some um, data lake type problems, yes. Um, that said though, we'll, I'm approaching from two different ways. So one is, um, if you're a, today if you're a data scientist, the, the threat hunting part of, you know, if, you're like a, if you're a security person, then you know, threat hunting, being a threat hunter is the, the apex, if you like, of your career in many ways. For a data scientist, you know, your, your apex uh, uh, today is to be a uh, adversarial AI you know, analyst type of thing. And so we're spending a lot on uh, and figuring out new ways of how to poison our own systems uh, and to, uh, to figure out how new ways that these attacks can sort of mitigate uh, how these types of attacks can go. But we are, the, 
this is a little bit different is that many of the, the techniques that have been used today that you'll see published, like you know, a stop sign and someone puts a few pieces of tape on and it becomes a rhinoceros or whatever, or a turtle or something like that. Um, those are, you know, traditionally have been things like uh, cognitive AI type systems and things like that. Um, and, and so we're looking at different approaches and stuff. You use multiple classes of models together. Uh, and AI systems, and then really look at how those things work together as opposed to solving for each one individually. Uh, so that, that's one aspect. The other aspect is we're also looking at new ways of, um, you know, if I train a new model, uh, uh, whether it's a Jupyter Notebook or some other deliverable, can I reverse engineer that model to be able to figure out what the raw data was uh, and still work back from that, right? Um, depending on how that was generated, things are changing very fast. Um, what we've also found, it was an interesting one, so I was advised by the uh, Microsoft lawyers and a few other places, was that um, today if you want to protect your you know, your classifier, your intellectual property inside uh, from a machine learning side, um, the traditional way is to use patents. So unfortunately for the US Patent Office has said that you can only patent, uh, so your patent has to, has to list the inventor. The inventor has to be human. So if an AI invents something, you can't actually use um, uh, patent law to protect it, apparently, so far today. So there's a lot going on you know, in the adversarial AI side. Um, today, you know, our primary approaches from a security perspective are we're using multiple different classes of models you know, and breaking those models into smaller chunks for, and then really looking at conditional access as a control for, you know, for um, actually mitigating the threat in real time. We've got two minutes. Any last questions? If that's it, then uh, thank you very much for your time. Cheers.